and welcome to In Retrospection, the show where we review the retro today. I am Joshua Caleb, and today I am joined, as always, by Graham Ellis. How, how are you today, the day after Halloween? Oh, much better, much better. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not a big fan of Halloween. Uh, it was, I like it. Not only is it my birthday. Well, yeah, that, that is true. So you have to kind of like it. <laughs> you know, what other day can you celebrate your birthday by giving candy to other people? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and getting it yourself when you're a kid by the bag full. Oh, yeah, that must have been fun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I've always liked Halloween. I'm not really into the big spooky... You know, pranks and that kind of stuff. I just nah. like dressing up and going out and getting candy. Well, today we were supposed to do this on Halloween, but there were some technical issues. But sort of in the spirit of the spooky whatnot, we're going to be covering some spooky Halloween-themed games. And we're starting off with a doozy here. Um... This, ironically, is one of the more gory games I have seen, and it was for an old arcade cabinet. We have Chiller. Oh, I remember this. Yeah, this... Yeah, that's been a long time since I've seen this one. Yeah, people say, you know, oh, video games have gotten so bloody and gory and the degrading and the violence and... um. They've said that about every game, though. Yeah, but it seems to get stronger with each generation, and the more advanced the graphics get and whatever. And here we had a light gun game back in the arcade where literally your only purpose was to shoot and destroy and obliterate and torture these poor naked people. Oh, it looks like we finally got another guest on the show. Yeah, Curtis Boyle. Hello, sorry for being late. <laughs> Got stuck downtown at the bank in a few businesses I was playing those with. Hmm. Sounds like fun. By the way, J uh, Joshua, we're really early for next Halloween. That's all. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> early Halloween 2012. Oh, this is a retro show, so this could be for, like, last Halloween or something, too. That's Halloween 1999. <laughs> All the best games. <laughs> so, had, Curtis, you're, are you the only one who's played Chiller? Uh, has... I have played it, yes. I think I, I know I played it once. It wasn't my kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a... When I watched the video, it was like... This is a hilariously disturbing game. Yeah, yeah. It, it was actually got a little bit infamous for being a little bit too gory for most people, but it wasn't super popular, so... Yeah, it, it, well, it wasn't really didn't have the gameplay. No, it's actually pretty boring. I mean, you just basically keep shooting the bodies as much as you got a timer. And you try to shoot as many of the bodies as you can, and also little things that are flying by. And you also have to shoot things that, like, crush people's heads so it rotates the thing there squash them and all kinds of things like that. Or feeding the alligator, in this case, you keep shooting to lower the rope. Yeah. Yeah, it just doesn't look that interesting. It's like... No, it's a really? very, very uninteresting game. Really? Especially that's, for a shooter gun. Yeah, that, that's all yeah, we're going to do. Just target practice is all it really is. Yeah. Yeah, I and mean, you're going to make these poor um, naked bodies as the targets? I mean... This was the a game made for... Um, a biker bar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I know we played it just basically for shock value because we heard, oh, this game is pretty gory. And for the, for the time, especially it was when it came out. Yeah. And then you're playing it, you're going, I can't believe they're letting this into an arcade. Yeah. So you play through all the levels once to see what new scenes are going to be and what new gore you can create while you're playing. And then after that, yeah, it's, it's pretty boring. So. Well, they even um, ported this to the NES. And well, I wasn't aware. Yeah, I think they ported it to the NES and it tanked. Well, they had to come up with a gun, a game for the light gun besides Duck Hunt, right? <laughs> yeah, that is true. <laughs> so this seems this seemed like it would be a harder game to play with a light gun. 
because the light gun was for sort of picky on what it yeah could pick up and whatnot. This I suppose I could have used the D-pad. That would have been awful. No, the gun would be better than the D-pad. <laughs> All right. Well, I think I think we've seen enough of, enough of this. Yeah, it's it's wouldn't be my favorite game. No, but it's, it's not... a Halloween game. Oh, definitely. It is that. Yeah. And I still think one of the up until maybe some of the fighter games more recently, I think the most gory game in the arcade. Yeah. yeah until I think, Mortal Kombat. Um, Mortal Kombat was the next target of choice for the violent games. Or games are violent. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I guess Maybe. that way, this one was precedent setting because I don't remember anything even closest. Well, they had a, they had a big, you know, big uh, deal about even Death Race, uh, the old Death Race game where you just ran over a block with another block and turned it into a tombstone. You know. Yeah, that one was more for the morality. That wasn't because it was gory or anything. So yeah, this, that's this true. This one that actually gave you the graphic. You know, you're seeing somebody's rib cage get blown away or get eaten by an alligator or getting their head crushed in a vice. That is true. Good, good, good family fun in the arcade. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Their well. target audience loved it <laughs> for about the first quarter. <laughs> it lasted me a couple of bucks because, like I said, I had to get through all the levels to see what new gore you could come up with when you got through them all. But after that, yeah, it's just, it's just target practice. Yeah. yeah. Against a timer, that's it. Well, next, well, let's see. next up we have on the NES... Ghost and Goblins, which this is, this is like widely regarded as the most difficult game or something. Uh, I thought that was Battletoads, but this is close. Battletoads <laughs> was just the one level. This was a hard game. I never could get much past the first couple of levels. Yeah, well, because you play as, what is this, King Arthur, or, or, I don't know, you play as a knight in armor. And apparently it's not very good armor because a single hit will reduce you to your boxers. Mm -hmm. so, and how do you get the armor back? I couldn't, I don't think I could ever figure out how to get the armor back. I think you find it, don't you? I think so. It's been a while since I played this game. Yeah, it comes along and you find it once you get to a certain point past where you lose it. Yeah, so you essentially play most of this game in your underwear. And fighting continuous onslaught of ghosts and goblins, I guess. This, this uh, being in the underwear seems to be a theme thing, because that's what you're shooting in Chiller, too. Yeah. <laughs> but what is it with Halloween and underwear? I, I think it might have to do with all the, uh, you know, the gore movies. Because they're always teenagers, you know, having sex or something somewhere, and then they get attacked by an axe wielding. Oh, uh, yeah. Right. Oh, and didn't you have, don't you have to beat this game twice or something crazy? I, uh, I think so, because when you get to the end, it, it, he basically, he's, the princess is not in this castle, and... <laughs> you know, oh, <laughs> classic. You have to start over again, you know, like, I mean, I'm pretty sure this is kind of where it originated, but <laughs> not quite that way. <laughs> and is it the exact same levels all the way through the second time? I believe so. Just faster. Well, yeah, because, I mean, how else would you logically extend the gameplay of a game than to just make the person repeat the same levels twice? I mean, you wouldn't come up with new levels. I mean, that's crazy. <laughs> they could at least change the color palette. Yeah, <laughs> after defeating the final boss for the first time, the players informed that the battle was a trap devised by Satan. Now, that is the actually player... probably true. I don't know. It probably is. I think it's just done by the marketing department. The player is then forced to replay the entire game on a higher difficulty level before reaching the genuine final battle. Well, how do you know that's not a trap? Uh, well, if you win, it probably says the end. Oh, yeah. Actually, at, at, the, uh, at the end, it says this game is happy end. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I guess if you like um, an exercise in frustration, you could play this game. 
Yeah, it's, it was ported over to most of the major systems and handhelds at one time. But, you know, I played it originally, I think, on the stand-up arcade. Yeah, that's where I did. And a uh, few quarters, frustration level, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, th- there were other ways to spend a quarter that were more reward- rewarding. Well, back then, a quarter bought something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, we'll move on to... Man, we've got a lot of games. Um, next, a real Halloween classic, Castlevania, which... I don't know if this was quite as hard as Ghosts and Goblins, but at least the gameplay was at least a little more interesting. But it was still a very hard game. Yeah, I never played the original here. I played, I think, uh, the Game Boy version of Belmont's Revenge, which is, I think, Castlevania 2 or something like that. That's what I played. Mm. Uh, pretty much the same game, platformer, we get the whip, monsters, that kind of thing. Yeah, and the, this, um, <laughs> I I was never able to get very far in this game because it was, it is, it is insanely hard. Um, but I know it's been praised for its game design and um, enemy placement. Some some of the where it pl- one of those games where it tries to teach you the gameplay mechanics as you play without an obvious tutorial thing. So they'll put an enemy or something just out of reach that will be attacking you, but you have room to avoid it, or you can see it attack before you actually get to it, so you know what his moves are. And then, of course, there's areas where it just throws enemies at you nonstop to frustrate you to no end. (laughs) This also has the... Because you had a health bar, unlike the Ghosts and Goblins, where you had two hits. Um, this well, you, you act- armor and underwear. Yeah. <laughs> this you actually have a health bar. And the, this is sort of threw me off. The hearts you collect don't refill your health bar. They refill your weapon, your um, secondary weapon. So I think how it worked. The hearts refill your, your secondary weapon, and in order, in order to recover your health, you either have to finish a level or find a turkey hidden in a wall. <laughs> okay. <laughs> One of them obvious things, right? <laughs> yeah. I, Dr- <laughs> Dracula is... obviously. Yeah, Dracula is known for keeping um, stuffed turkeys in his walls. Well, you know, he, he has to celebrate Thanksgiving after Halloween, so... Yeah, you, you gotta be prepared. Just, he's just prepping. <laughs> I think this this also has at least more of the later ones. I don't think it was quite as much in this one sort of spawned that Metroidvania that sort of slightly open-ended um, side-scroller where it wasn't quite the Mario Brothers left to right progression. He had a little he had a little more opportunity to explore the environment and t- take it at your own pace, you know, don't just um, blaze ahead. Be thoughtful about your platforming lest you get your head lopped off by a knight. Oh, is that Medusa? Oh, yep. Lovely Medusa head. Yeah, I don't know who these people are that are so insanely good at these games. Well, some of them you can do it in an emulator and then you save and then just place it together. Oh, yep, yep. Or run a trainer. Um, So you have to take some of those videos that people do of speed throughs and walk throughs uh, with a grain of salt. Yeah, some of them have those tool-assisted speed runs and whatnot. But uh, some of them are really, really good. Yep. I remember seeing a few of them in the arcade. Mm-hmm. 
I've seen people play all day on one quarter on a, some games. Yeah. More I patience than I. Guys. <laughs> no. I didn't mind putting a quarter in and try it out, but uh, I, I wasn't really half decent at video games until I mastered Halo. <laughs> <laughs> at least I like to say that. Hmm. I, I like to think I've mastered dumb. Up, I, could, I could do up to about three hours on a good day, but that was, that was the best one I was in. Yeah. I think the only game I've mastered is Donkey Kong Country. And you are good. <laughs> yeah. The, the rest of these, I'm either terrible to adequate. It, it's funny how some, some of us can actually end up focusing in or on a particular game something about the mechanic or the play uh -huh. comes, you get you it's attuned to you uh-huh exactly yeah though i'm not half bad at sonic the hedgehog either mario's a liffy oh shoot. move on to actually taking a console upgrade here to the sega genesis with a rather bizarre um, Halloween-themed game. This is Haunting, starring Polterguy. <laughs> hey, this one I've not seen before. Yeah, <laughs> I have never heard of this, and I, I, find, I played it a little bit, and it's a very, very weird game. I, I th you play as this kid who is apparently somehow killed by this rich family, I think. And then, anyway, for some reason, he wants revenge, and he's a ghost now. So, the object is to skate around in your rollerblades around their house, possessing their furniture, and s scare the living daylights out of them, so that they'll leave the house. <laughs> Well, A plus on novel concept. <laughs> yeah, it's and they were kind of they were pretty creative with some of the stuff. You don't just possess a thing and uh, possess the bookshelf and make it shake or stuff. I mean, some of the stuff you get to do with the furniture is actually pretty creative. Like, and some of them Did you can actually come out near when the Poltergeist movie was out or one of the Poltergeist movies. I was thinking like Beetlejuice, or maybe yeah. Uh... Well, it's ninety three. And that's no, way, way past Poltergeist. Then. Yeah. Yeah, but like you, you just jump, and there's like you have to do different family members because there's a total of four of them. So you have to go around and possess various, even doors and whatnot, and scare each of them out of the house. But you have to do it. Yeah, you have to do it fast because you have a limited amount of um, polter goo or some some ectoplasm. Yes, <laughs> <Maybe>. you have <laughs> a limited have amount of uh, goo, and when they leave, when they run out of the house scared, which actually they run between rooms, so you have to completely chase them out of the house. So each time they one of the family members leaves the room you get a bunch of more goo basically extending your time. And if you run out of time, then you get then you get summoned back to um hell or something and have to complete a little timed challenge to get back to the real world or something. Yeah, this is definitely a Beetlejuice inspired <laughs> Yeah, because it's got the sense of comedy to it too. Like, Polter yeah, which did not. Certainly. <laughs> yeah, the 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 moving, the skating around and possessing furniture items and scaring the family is a, is kind of novel and sort of interesting. Um, and you can possess just about everything in the house. Um, the I think the I think the worst part of the game was if you run out of time and get sent back to hell you the challenge or whatever there was a little tedious or frustrating so it's like a completely different um gameplay mechanic uh. 
So this is like Sim Ghost. Yeah, kind of. But the, the, the layout reminds me of the 3D isometric view. Yeah. Yeah, it is kind of funny watching a, um, a floor rug start bleeding or the possess the guy's um, table saw and a hand pops out of it and starts running around the floor chasing. And yet that you can actually control and chase the guy. Kind of like it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now you have to. This was, this was only on the Genesis, or? I think so. I didn't remember seeing it anywhere else. So supposedly it would be, it was to be ported to the PSP. I'm not sure if it made it though. But well, they said there's a similar game called Ghostmaster, which was released in 2003. That could have been the port. Mm. Oh, that's for yeah, Xbox and PlayStation 2. Yeah, the the it is fun, but it does get repetitive because I think I don't know how many houses there are, but it's basically the same deal through each house. Once you scare them out of one house, they move into another house, and you have to scare them there. And I think you're basically trying to you know, scare them homeless. Man, he can jump high. All right, well, on to our next um, wacky Halloween game. Um, we have decap attack. Where you play as like a Frankenstein mummy thing with no head. I thought it was a giant tooth. <laughs> it does. It does look like a tooth. It's actually a big long ad for Colgate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's that that Timothy Tooth dude or whatever, whatever that heck, heck that puppet's name was. But yeah, you're you're supposed to be like this Frankenstein mummy thing created by this scientist, and he, your eyes are on your chest, and you can attack with like your mouth or something crazy like that but you can also collect an actual head that you can use to throw as a projectile but it's basically pretty standard platformer mm. not, not, nothing too interesting other than the fact that you can throw your own head <laughs> yeah it looks pretty standard Ah uh, yes, your name is Chuck D. Head, and, oh. you, are, and you are a mummy. Oh, we gotta love those bad. You should do a show on bad pun games. Oh, this game, this <laughs> game is full of them. Every level is some kind of pun, some kind of Halloween-themed pun. Well, Josh, you, did you get that one uh, video link I had to that old poker game called Fangman? Oh, that um. Dracula that was vampire. One of really bad puns. Yeah. <laughs> There's something about computer designers, game designers, and puns. Oh <laughs> uh, yes, and the and the mad scientist that created Chuck D. Head. Guess what his name is. Um, I want to try. <laughs> Dr. Frank N. Stein. Oh, okay. That's that's an old one. That's actually been just a few times. Yeah, and you're trying... Walk um, this way. <laughs> Steen! It's Steen! <laughs> <laughs> and you're in the evil bad guy villain is Max Decap. And... I, I don't remember the names of all the levels, but every level is some bad pun. I like how your your health marker there is actually like a, a, a mock-up of a real heart rather than a nice cutesy heart that most games did. Oh, yeah. That's original. 
Hey, I actually don't see many games doing an actual heart heart. Not unless someone's ripping them out. Uh, yeah, there, <laughs> there is that. Yeah. But I mean, given even the theme and the, what we could say the graphicness of the hearts, it's pretty, you know, not not exactly a scary game. <laughs> no. No, it's just more the theme. It's more like a cutesy. Yeah, it's just a cutesy Hollywood, Hollywood eyes theme. Uh huh. So you know, nice and safe for the kids to play. No controversy there, that kind of thing. You know, nope. Killer probably actually has some gameplay. <laughs> I bet you does. Yeah, it's a, it's at least a platformer. I I, I can say mm -hmm. that. I, I don't know about the quality of the platforming. I mean, it's a he's a uh, your mummy dude is a little floaty, but it's not. It's not unplayable. Yeah. Well, it sure didn't spawn a whole series of games. That's we know that. <laughs> uh, no, it did not. All right. Well, I think what our network's moving on to a PC game, and you guys have probably never played this. I'm guaranteeing it. <laughs> 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 the, the only reason I mention this game is because of the intro sequence was actually that they, they set this up as classic horror movie um, stuff. And it's actually probably at least the intro part is, is one of the more creepy um, segments of any of the Nancy Drew detective games, which are actually pretty good games if you like the old style point and click adventure games. Oh, like, I used to play a ton of those. Yeah, this is this is stuff like straight out of Mist and all, all those Cir first person point and clicks. Yeah, Circle of Blood. Um, one that I played. Some of the uh, Sierra Online ones. Yeah, I like those games. Th this is just like that. <laughs> But yeah, so the set, the setup here is you're Nancy Drew going to this old abandoned cabin because um, your friend got freaked out about something. So you're staying at the cabin all by yourself in the middle of nowhere. Um, no transportation. You get there, night falls, you hear about these supposed ghost dogs that haunt the place. And they they start pulling all the all the tricks when the ghost dogs show up. Having the, you hear them howling, then you hear the lights, then the lights flicker, and the place starts shaking for some reason. Let's see if we can fast forward. Oh yeah, you get to talk to lots of people. You meddling kids. <laughs> oh, sorry, wrong guys. <laughs> Yeah, here we go. I think. Oh yeah, now now we go inside, which I'm actually kind of disappointed they didn't play up this more in in the rest of the game. I think it's only in the intro sequence. This is not good. Well, the, the, the all these supposed ghost dogs start running around the house and banging on the doors, apparently messing with the electricity, and knocking stuff down. Kind of sounds like that snowstorm in the east. <laughs> yeah, which, look, looking at them now, they don't look as terrifying, but back when I played this, because this is one of the older games, um, this is one of the scariest spots in Nancy Drew games. But oddly enough, they don't, the ghost dogs don't appear throughout the rest of the game. <laughs> Which is kind of weird. I mean, obviously at the Except end... False advertising. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously at the end of the game, when you, you 
do the whole Scooby-Doo reveal of you know, they're not really ghost dogs, blah, blah, blah. Oh, spoiler. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the dogs are obviously there. But as far as the ghost dogs, they don't show up other than the opening, which is kind of weird. Maybe they're really ghost dogs. Mm. Oh, yeah. They're calling from the house. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> The, the most famous phrase in any point and click game I have ever played it's locked <laughs> I don't and know it goes back to the old text adventure <laughs> I don't know how many times I have heard that you're in the lane to the west you see a house yeah. it's, locked. Door, it's locked it's locked <laughs> you see a treasure chest open chest it's locked <laughs> yeah. mm. alright well we'll move on to another classic this is slightly more horror that you I don't know if you've played but you've at least heard of this one I'm not sure if I played two or not <laughs> yeah the, the, the only reason I, I did Resident Evil 2 as opposed to 1 is because I know a little bit more about it and it's, I think this is the one that introduces the sort of series icon, Leon Kennedy. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I played one on the PlayStation. I'm trying to remember, is that where it started was on the PlayStation? Or was it before that? I think it was the PlayStation. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was a PlayStation franchise. Yeah, the, this is your classic zombie horror game. Your zombie shooter. A bizarre incident occurred in the outskirts of an American suburb called Raccoon City. Which, <laughs> I actually, I played this game for the first time the other day, and I died within the first 10 seconds of the game. <laughs> Well, you have said that first-person shooters... This isn't a first-person shooter. It's an overhead one, isn't it? No, this is a third-person... This is a locked camera third-person... Oh, okay. Um, ...horror game with tank controls. <laughs> tank controls. Yes. Little stick. I, and I have never really played a game with tank controls. <laughs> You have to define for me with tank controls. I mean, if I'm used to battle zone, you have two joysticks you have to in opposite directions to get you to turn. I'm assuming that's not what we're talking about. No, the tank tank controls are what I figured out is okay. So you have your D-pad up, down, left, right, and you're in a 3D kind of environment, and up goes forward, down goes backward, left and right turn your character. They don't run left and right. Oh, okay. So you have to turn with left and right and then press up to run forward. Otherwise, you'll just sit there spinning like a top. Oh, okay. That's a little different than I thought. Yeah, so trying, trying to do that in the this, in this sort of fixed camera position, they you know, have those little cinematic angles to the camera. Mm. So you can't move the camera and you're locked in this position and then you have to try and run around these zombies while shooting at them um it sounds like me trying to play halo <laughs> <laughs> yeah learning, learning to look up and move forward <laughs> <laughs> yeah they was i basically got out of the cutscene and got there was looking around and trying to figure out how to move and then all the zombies started coming and i'm like okay now how do i shoot I tried pressing the, I pressing all the different buttons and I got mauled. I finally figured out it was a combination of buttons to shoot, and then oh. you have to make sure you're pointed in the right direction, otherwise you're uh, yeah. shooting at nothing. It's, it's called aiming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all these technical gaming terms. Yes, yes. aiming is very important. <laughs> that's a, that's your major skill in a, any kind of zombie game. <laughs> yes, unless unless you're doing a knife run. Oh yeah. Which I actually yeah. tried. That didn't go so well. 
Actually, that's something they basically have introduced more so in the third-person shooters, in, like in more recent times, versus the old arcades where you aim separate from where you're facing. I think the only game I remember in the like old style that would have that would have been Robotron. Yeah, two joysticks. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a few games I played on the Xbox Live that used the Robotron controls, right? The two sticks. Mm -hmm. One's your shooting, one's your movement. That's what I meant by tank controls. So, because it's okay. two sticks, which is not. Yeah, because I mean, Battlezone had two sticks, but you you push you know both sticks forward to drive forward, both sticks to drive back. If you want to turn left, you pull the left one left, and the right one you push up. Yeah. Just like a, a real tank would control. That's what I thought you meant by tank controls. No, I, I think I think they they coined they used tank controls with this type of game. Is that mm -hmm. it's very slow. It's not a quick yeah. reaction. You can't you just think, run left or run right. Yeah, if you think about it, it's tank controls with one D-pad. Yeah. Because you're turning like a tank and then moving forward. You're turning again and then moving backwards or forward. Yeah, you have to make your movement turn movements are separate from your forward and back. So it's like really bad tank controls. Oh yeah. <laughs> Well, the slow thing I was—I remember that from Battlezone because you—you you turned like a real tank, like it was dog slow. Mm-hmm. And you're trying to hope that you turn faster than the other guy. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah, this was a good, uh, good series, but. Uh, yeah, it, once you get used to the controls, it's not bad. Um, mm. I'm not a real big fan of zombies, really. I'm I'm more in vampires. Now well, I'm trying to remember what was the mood like in this. Was it was it, was it like a very suspenseful type game, or is it more just a shoot 'em up? It wasn't really a shoot 'em up. Um, I think they tried to go for more suspense, and that there were always zombies popping out at every corner. Um, you never knew where they were going to come from. Um, you could often was, hear them before you saw them. Yeah, it wasn't left for dead kind of mass zombies. Yeah, I was starting to, th trying to remember if it was something like, say, Half Life, the first Half Life, because that was a very suspenseful game. Yeah. Yeah, well, and then. The first Resident Evil was kind of like that. You had to do a lot of exploring, yeah. uh, trying to figure out what was going on, you know, that kind of thing. It was almost an RPG element to it. Yeah, very yeah, much so. Yeah, we actually so. learned the story as you go that you don't really yeah. have a precedent setting story. Yeah. Like yeah, and then they, they even sort of upped the atmosphere, just sort of. Um, nice is the there were save rooms um, s scattered throughout and an interesting thing where a, a save room had a unique sort of piano melody uh, music to it, a sound to it so it was like as soon as you entered a room you knew exactly that it was a safe room because no zombies would come into a save room so as right. soon as you heard that music you're like ah oh, finally and you I could take you take a, take a breath <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> now, would you guys consider like the Doom series as a Halloween-style franchise, or is that just more of a three D shooter? You know, I never really considered that much of a Halloween game. Because that was just I know it has blown up aliens. monsters, just a monster game. Yeah, because I know Doom Three, like just the, the the atmosphere they had there, especially with the improved graphics, that was a very suspenseful one too. Because those stuff was yeah. tearing out of the wall, you all of a sudden. But yeah, I don't know if I'd consider it really strictly Halloween, even though it's old. That was so, to me. That was always a science fiction. Yeah, this is a sci-fi shooter. Yeah, it, I know it's demons of hell come up through some old ga gap and stuff, but if possibly a feral dimension, whatever. I always considered it more, even the original, to be sort of a futuristic space. Yeah, because you were on Mars, I think it was, wasn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of tried to cross a couple of genres there, and, and, and basically being just a straight, straight first-person shooter. Yeah. I, I remember, though, when Doom 3 came out, like the first graphics demos of that, because that was so much more advanced graphic-wise than anybody else. It was, you know, and, and showing you the live stuff, it almost looked like a horror movie. It was really dark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I uh, I didn't really care for Doom Three too much. It was too play play wise. No, I mean it looked awesome. Oh yes, it did. And and the even the sound effects and stuff and, and the suspense of not knowing what's happening with all the lighting, you know, with the spinning fans and stuff like that. But yeah, yeah. the gameplay was just basic. Yeah, it was almost on the rails. Just about.
All right. I think uh, the iPhone and iPad version of Doom is come almost completely on the rails. It literally is a rail. <laughs> oh, yeah. How are you going to do uh, WSD mouse? <laughs> you, know, you can't do your circle of Doom. You le I learned to do that with the mouse and keyboard. That's where I learned it. It's right of the gyro. You just have to literally spin in a circle to do it. But well, you get dizzy fast. <laughs> <laughs> Or it gets mixed up like it half half the time it does. Huh. You have to sit there and do the figure eight, recycle your compass. <laughs> Please align back to magnetic north. <laughs> All right. I swear every time I turn on the compass on my phone, I have to do that. Huh. I haven't had to do it too much on mine, but yeah, every once in a while it does get thrown off. Who are you? The GPS is where it's good for your inside where there's a. You know, cement building or something, it completely loses it. Mm -hmm. All right, so next up, also on the PS1, another horror game that's actually kind of the opposite, I guess, of atmosphere wise on Resident Evil. Um, Silent Hill takes sort of the opposite approach of not throwing stuff at you constantly. I guess they go for their namesake, um, Silent. It's a creepy game. And create fear through <laughs> silence. Yeah, where the suspense is based on your anticipation of what's going to happen. Yeah, not not, <laughs> not of what they're, sink at you. <laughs> they're... They're not throwing stuff at you constantly, and that's why you're constantly terrified, because you think they're going to throw something at you. Yep. They, they up-tempo the music. Uh, sense of fall, so maybe I'm not going to get attacked. You know? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. These PS1 games had these really, really long CG cutscenes at the beginning. They had to fill up the disc, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they had, they had to advertise. This is when they were starting to experiment with cinematics, where they were trying to get it to look like a movie. Yeah. yeah. A lot of these cutscenes. And then they kind of figured out after doing it for a little bit, that, you know, we're kind of overdoing it, guys. Yeah. Especially in games where they would where they would show you all of the cutscenes in the entire game at the at the before the menu screen. Uh, especially at the ones that force you to watch them. There's no excuse. Oh skip. yeah. And I didn't know <sighs> the cutscenes if it actually, you know, resembled the gameplay but if they had something that looked incredibly awesome and then you played the game and it didn't look anywhere near <laughs> or play anywhere near as good that was kind of disappointing yeah it takes you out of the environment yeah yeah it's especially a game and a movie not not one integrated experience yeah now this is a game that was made into a movie like resident evil yeah, actually, yeah. Right, yeah. which is so even do... weirder than the game just as weird as the game i mean it's bizarre <laughs> yeah because isn't like silent hill like all about these alternate like parallel universes and stuff it's like really mind bending yeah pyramid head and all these weird nurses i mean it's where resident evil is just this evil corporation creating these viruses that turn everyone into, into zombies right and, and i won't even mention the doom movie <laughs> <laughs> the rock come on doom. <laughs> it had Dwayne in it Apparently he needed money. <laughs> oh, maybe, maybe he liked the game. <laughs> I think he liked the endorsements. <laughs> now this game actually this this didn't have quite the fixed camera angles as Resident Evil did. It was a little more open ended. At least from the little bit I've played of it. But it has that nice um, infinite fog. <laughs> the, you know, the PS1 couldn't really render three feet in front of you, so they had to cloak everything in a mysterious fog, make it seem scary. That's the atmosphere, though, so actually in that case it worked. I mean, it is a bit of a yeah. in the hardware limitations, but it's mm -hmm. an innovative way of doing it. Because, I mean, a lot of the other games at the time would just drop their poly count terribly, and all of a sudden you'd be walking towards stuff, and all of a sudden a mound would pop out of nowhere. Oh. Like a tree or something like that. It didn't, like, grow larger as it got. It was just, there's mm -hmm. nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing. Here's a huge tree that fills the whole screen. I remember that. 
Okay, now uh, if you go, if you arrive at this town that is completely empty and you walk down an alley and see blood and dead bodies, that's usually a bad sign. <laughs> well, there's a certain amount of suspension of disbelief required for horror movies <laughs> <laughs> and games. Just, just a tell. <laughs> yeah. You know, like when the kid, a girl sees something outdoors and goes outdoors and then sees it in the woods and goes into the oh, woods. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, evil dead comes. You know, that's... <laughs> you know, this, they tried to portray your the character you play as more of an everyman rather than the combat-ready police dude from Resident Evil. So I think they actually, if, if in this game, if you ran too much, your character actually got tired and you'd be like <laughs> visibly panting. It kind of reminds me of that old Nagrath game we covered a few months back. What's <laughs> going on? Oh, man, creepy children with knives. It's a creepy game. <laughs> yeah. Aren't all children creepy? Oh, sorry. <laughs> children of the corn. There you go. There's a good one. <laughs> Malachi. The Malachi. <laughs> yeah. The, the old man with Damien. Yep. I watched all those. <laughs> yeah. But that you actually, I think you have to die in that sequence. That's kind of weird. You... Oh yeah, and you, don't don't you love those cutscenes where basically all it is is just just to show the character you're going to be talking to, so they give you a little CG cutscene so the character looks really cool. How do you feel? So then when you actually do the dialogue and in game the character looks terrible. Oh, like I've been run over by a truck. <laughs> Oh, well, I think that was part of the limitations of the hardware at the time, because you couldn't render well enough to do it. Nowadays, it's, a, it's not as much of a concern. As I said, they just fill in the discs up. <laughs> yeah, they had a whole CD of 400 megabytes. Uh, six, 640. 640, that's it. Oh, and uh, they did a lot of those videos to fill it up and add extras in. I'd like to find out myself. I mean, a lot of games, even recent games, still don't use the engine. The game engine themselves are doing the cinematics. Yeah. Only... turned seven last month, short, black hair. And it really distracts. Oh no, I think it distracts from the game. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, because you're almost like there's two different things going on. You got your movie. Mm -hmm. You're watching the movie and then you're playing the game. You're not um, playing the game. Yeah. But this is a slow game. I mean, it's all about exploring and figuring out the mystery of this foggy town. Uh, yeah. What's yeah, it's name? a bit more suspense-based. Mm -hmm. Though when I was playing it, it seemed like they Harry kept throwing Mason. those um, demon dogs and flying pterodactyl things at you a lot. I'm a police officer from Brams, the next town over. That's where the demon dogs went from Nancy Drew when you couldn't find them at the end. Too. They got lost in the fog. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they went to, they ran to Silent Hill and got lost in the parallel dimensions. The, the fringe. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you think you're going? My daughter. I've got to find her. Such voice acting too, you know. <laughs> My daughter. I've got to find her. <laughs> Yeah, especially when you get into the Japanese anime games, then it was absolutely atrocious. They, they always do their stuff over the top, though. I mean, even anime TV shows and stuff are quite Have over the top. Have you got a gun? It's, it's just it's the way they like that genre. Um, no. I find sometimes the dubs go just really different with it, though. Take this. You know, when they dub it in English? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's... Now listen to me. 
Before you pull the trigger, know who you're shooting. Oh yeah, just give a guy a gun. For no particular reason. And don't do it unless you have to. Yeah, that's your gun tutorial. <laughs> I don't think it's more from the NRA website. <laughs> I don't think this one was quite as hard to figure out how to shoot. You do best to yeah, stay I think this was a little easier. I'll be back with help as quick as I can. Well, they don't give you much time to learn because it was at the. I think right in this sequence, they give you uh, some target practice right off the bat. Well, that was the one thing about most games. If they, if you came across a really good gun, you're worried about what you really needed the good gun for. Ah, uh, yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Was it a BFG type thing? Then you know you're going to be in trouble soon. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the giant demon. <laughs> What's that? See, that sound I do not get. I think that weird on? ringing noise plays every time one of those flying demons shows up. And I don't get why. You be giving off electromagnetic radiation on the radio spectrum. Uh, yeah, maybe that's it. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> the demons are um, radioactive or... Are... This is not a dream. I'm trying to figure out, like, looking at this, that's sort of a green bench. Isn't this where the Michael Jackson Beat It video was shot? Part of it. <laughs> okay. Just one. Yeah, he actually did that in Silent Hill and um, shortly thereafter disappeared into an alternate dimension. Well, then, then, then I think the Thriller video came out when he was a zombie. They could have borrowed the whole set. <laughs> <laughs> the homage right in the game. All right, well, we should probably move on. We're running close to an hour, and we still have a couple games. Did you have an ad, too? I... No, you. unfortunately, I do not have an ad. But oh, okay. if somebody we wants have an to... ad for an ad. Yeah, if somebody <laughs> wants to have an ad, it would cost you about five bucks, and... Go to j75.me slash 5 ad and how's all the info? And there's that horrible ringy noise again. See, then you always knew when the demons were coming because they rang first. That's probably the whole sole purpose of that MacGuffin. <laughs> and there probably was some, uh, you know, made up explanation as to why that is happening. But having a, uh, like you were mentioning before, you can hear monsters before you see them type thing. This is the same type of thing where you get a warning, body warning, but suspense. no visual the, cue as to what direction they're coming from. Or else. Yeah, just to build suspense. Yeah. Why the ringing? Just to know. I mean, the developer was answering the phone at the time and accidentally recorded that. <laughs> that is some demon scream and just said, screw it. I'll leave that. I don't have time to fix that. He mm -hmm. probably made it his ringtone afterwards, too. <laughs> That'd actually be a very inter interesting ringtone. I prefer one of the chiller screams for a ringtone. I think that would be awesome. <laughs> uh, you'd freak some people out with that. I use the uh, turret. I don't like the Wilhelm scream. <laughs> <laughs> I use the turret sounds for uh, Portal as my ringtone. Hello? Uh, nice. Is anybody there? <laughs> mm. Or a Malachi quote. Hmm. Don't go in the corn, Malachi. So what do you have next here? We got Sir, Doors Mask? Yeah, kind of an un unexpected game, but hmm. it kind of fits. He, I was wearing, wearing masks. <laughs> you wouldn't really expect a Zelda game to be that creepy and horror-ish, but I, we, we've talked before about the Redeads you know, from Ocarina of Time, mm -hmm. which this game not only has the Redeads, you have the happy mask salesman who is incredibly creepy which i i haven't completely finished the game so i don't know what the 
if he if how big he plays into the plot or whatever but he was just sort of this weird npc in the ocarina of time and he was always sort of strange then but this um they really brought out his creepy side i guess And then this whole game was actually very dark because you have you're basically given a three day limit to save the world, otherwise the moon's gonna crush the town. And when whenever you look up in the sky and you see this uh, giant enormous moon with this demonic face, you know, coming down toward the sky and getting closer and closer, um, it kind of gives you a little sense of anxiety in that. You don't have a lot of time here. <laughs> I figured the moon would take out a lot more than a single town. I was thinking that too. <laughs> but hey, it's that's no moon. It's really small. <laughs> now, this is a big moon. A very angry moon. And a very angry mask salesman. Not quite sure what his beef is. This was originally on the N64, was it? Yeah. One of the few times there were two Zelda games on a single console. But there's, there's actually kind of a creepy Zelda game overall. Especially what kind of surprised me is, the, well, obviously this happy mask salesman is really creepy. Um, is the whole mask mechanic behind this is why is he banging his head? <laughs> when, whenever you put on some of the masks, it's like you're torturing Link, which. I don't know, well, you're playing this little kid Link and you put on this fu funny looking mask and then he screams in pain. Yeah. One of Nintendo's many odd design choices. Almost a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde approach. When you put the mask on, you become like Dr. Jekyll. Yeah. Literally becoming the character. With all his powers, which is obviously why you wear the mask. Uh-huh. It definitely has a darker graphic feel than most of the ones in the series. Mm. Yeah, but very, very much so. Now, I haven't played all the Zeldas. Is this the only one that has this kind of a feel to it? In the series, or is there... Others like this. Um, some of the other ones have moments, like the Rededs in Ocarina of Time, um, and Wind Waker. But as far as a just general overall feeling of just sort of creepiness and dread or whatnot, yeah, this is this is definitely the darkest. Probably the only one that came close is Twilight Princess. I'm kind of curious how the sales of this one would have been versus the other ones. I wonder, was this something that really took off or maybe didn't take off and kind of reined it back a bit? Well, it's not one that I know a lot of people talk about. No, it's definitely... a bit offsetting to the people that are into the more positive mm. style. It's definitely not one of the more popular Zelda games. Um, there are definitely... it's de It definitely has its defenders that absolutely love it. Because well, it definitely... Sorry, according to this, it sold 3 million copies. And how does that compare with the rest of the series? Um, hmm. We shall find out. That's probably nothing compared to Ocarina. Uh, Ocarina sold 7.6 million. It's over twice as much. Mm-hmm. And I bet you the first one sold quite a bit more. 
So this this one that might have been a bit of an experiment to, to try to dart a little bit of a darker theme, and then they discovered the sales weren't as well, and maybe haven't really followed up on it. Well, they're yeah. probably trying to go for a more adult audience, as you. Yeah. Yeah, probably, and which is interesting because the game directly after this one is Wind Waker, which took things in the total opposite direction with its well, cartoon. Well, sales dropped by half, that might have been a good reason to do so. <laughs> Yeah, probably. If, it, if sales decrease from seven million to three million, that's that's you know, over half sales lost. So maybe they lost the younger audience or the parents of the younger kids that were going, "Hey, oh, you're not playing this one." Yeah, and then they come out with Wind Waker, and then everyone complains, which is weird. <laughs> but they bought it. Yeah, I don't know what the what are the sales on Wind Waker. I know it was a very controversial title just out of the art style, which I personally thought was um, excellent. Yeah, I was just going to take a look here. Let's see, they don't have really, they don't really have any numbers for it. Huh. Oh yeah, and um, <clears throat> the Majora's Mask actually spawned a full-on horror novel I don't know if it's actually been written as a novel but it's like this whole horror story about this possessed N64 cartridge of Majora's Mask that this guy supposedly got and it was like this sentient possessed cartridge that is really crazy watching it some of the stuff it did which obviously people have debunked as <laughs> to how he actually did it and whatnot, but still pretty creepy. It's called Ben. Or I think that's the cartridge. It's called Ben. But yeah, here's how we start out. <laughs> and I, I don't remember how the how it exactly goes, but it's like those totally glitched up game save on there that like won't let him continue or play it's like the guy is trying to play this game but the game keeps hindering him and blocking his way and doing all this crazy stuff on its own that it shouldn't be doing and there are times where it's like it knows what he's doing Oh yeah, I have no idea what this statue is, but man, is that thing creepy. I think when he moves, you can... there's this weird statue of Link. Can't see. Yeah. Oh, they missed it. There's like a weird statue of Link with this weird toothy grin that follows you around that is like really, really creepy. And then, like, it would play music backwards and do all kinds of weird stuff. There, there's all kinds what, of videos on YouTube. What was when we were wondering about the sales figures for? Wind Waker. Yeah, not available as of this one. I still got here. Yeah, this game also required the expansion pack for the N64. Uh, yeah. To, uh, oh, that, might, that might have limited sales, too. Because if you need oh, to yeah. Hardware. That yeah. was a big limitation. Because I think the first game to require it was Donkey Kong 64, which that came with it. I don't... This didn't come with it, did it? Uh, no. So, yeah, if people hadn't bought Donkey Kong 64, they wouldn't have been able to play this. Okay, I got some failed sales figures here. What is this? this is from September of 2008, though. Wind Waker was 4.55 million at that time, and Majora's Mask was 3.36 million. So they went up a little bit. Yeah, about a million and a quarter. And then Ocar Ocarina is the, the best-selling one, 
followed by Legend of Zelda. Yeah, I want to play through the rest of this, but it's definitely a kind of creepy Zelda game. Hopefully my um, game file won't be as, um, won't be possessed like this one. <laughs> Cause that would that would be really creepy. Yeah, save game bugs are really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Especially ones that seem to um know what you're doing and throwing you all over the place. Make you drown underwater while you're a Zora and burst make you burst into flames when you play a song. Alright. Uh, let's see, next we have one. I actually have not had a chance to play this one, but I think, Graham, you've played um, Medieval. Uh, yes, I have. Yeah, it's. Uh, I played the first one, and I think there's a sequel on the PlayStation as well, Medieval 2. So this is a hack and slash? It's not a platformer, is it? Well, kind of not. It's more of a third-person hack and slash. It's like Ghost and Goblins, but you're third day. You have these set uh, fields that you have to go through. You usually have a gate or a door to unlock. You have the monsters popping up out of the ground. You have your weapons. It's uh, It's got a bit of humor to it. Uh, it's kind of fun. Yeah, because you, you play as a resurrected knight or something. It's like a skeleton. Yeah. Originally, you were the guy who got the credit for killing this um, demon lord, this evil wizard. And you get killed by getting an arrow in the eye before the battle even starts, or basically at the first of the battle. And your troops go on and win, and they resurrect a big statue in front of you. And when the wizard resurrects himself, he raises the dead, and you're dead. So you get raised up and you go out to kill and defeat the wizard again. Only you're not really all that brave and <laughs> not really all that competent. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a bit of a humorous um, yeah. comedy. Yeah, it's, it, there's a, as I said, there's a little bit of comedy to it. Uh, as you can see, there's some puzzles. You have to move the gate there to open up different gates, to open up newer sections. Um. It, it's a nice, yeah, I would call it, it's not like a platformer and it's not really um, uh, some, you know, later later games like uh, Donkey Kong 3D type games, but there's elements there. Mm -hmm. And which, which platforms was this on? This was on the originally the PlayStation. Um, it may have been ported to um, another system, um, like the PlayStation three might be or should be able to play it and i think the psp plays it as well yeah it was one of the, they re, they re-released it on the playstation network so you could play it on a ps3 or psp but it was one of those minor series games uh there's some secrets you know to find treasures um get upgrades but mostly it's hack and slash and solve the puzzles Mm-hmm. Of course, this is obviously the German version that you've got here. <laughs> oh, is it? I, yeah. I couldn't tell. <laughs> it's the language, uh, the game language. <laughs> well, that's actually probably somewhat fitting, considering the story and locale. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah, you play uh, Sir Daniel Fortkesk, Fortkesk, Fort aka Kesk. Sir Dan. <laughs> oh, that's a very knightly name. Yeah. It's a it's a it's a good game. I uh, I I enjoyed it for the type of game it is, you know that type that era. Just sort of that simple, fun. Not well, there was enough puzzles in it, and there was a little bit of strategy and how you fought certain other monsters because there's different ones who are susceptible to different weapons. 
Uh, there were secrets you did exploring to get to them. Um, they it's kind, kind of like um, Spyro. It, exactly. That's that's the game series I was thinking of. Is what it's like, like Spyro. Just did, did it have much of an open world? I mean, Spyro had a little bit. Uh, this had not as much. It was very linear. So um, Spyro, not quite as open. Yeah. It was more like set levels, you know, with the uh, one path through, but you had other places to explore. <laughs> All right. Um, next up, moving to the GameCube, one of my personal favorites. Have Luigi's Mansion. Which I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not exactly sure what genre you would classify this, because it controls like a, um, it kind of controls like a first-person shooter, yet it's in third person and you don't actually do any shooting. Hmm. So I'm not sure what you would call it. Third-person runner? Yeah, it's certainly a mixed metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cause, well, and you. You do, you run around the man this mansion, and you have a flashlight in a vacuum, the Poltergust, three thousand, and you basically just use the flashlight to stun ghosts and use the vacuum to suck them up. Ah, so that's where Alan Wake got it from. It. Well, and Alan Wake ripped it off later with the flashlight, eh? Yeah, it was very very <laughs> much like Alan Wake. He, light stun weapon thing kills. You have to change vacuum bags too, or <laughs> no, um, man no changes the bag. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you do after a boss Mario's fight. Mario's job. <laughs> uh, after a boss fight, you do have to go back to the lab and empty the canister because the bosses are apparently very large and fill it up. <laughs> oh, you do that? Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah, so you do have to empty the <laughs> the vacuum and they gum it up. <laughs> yeah, and. Uh, yeah, apparently all the ghosts are supposed to be paintings because this inventor guy egad <laughs> had created a machine that turns ghosts into paintings and they somehow escape so now you have to go find them all and then he turns them back into paintings i think bad puns must be the forte of actual halloween games because the other ones we've been doing suspenseful bit of horror don't have the bad puns but all the ones that are actually seem designed for halloween seem to have bad puns in Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th <laughs> I think it's a, a a very basic attempt to liven it up and bring it down to a, a less threatening level. <laughs> yeah, you know, sort of add a joking to it so it's not so serious. Right, exactly. So Chiller is just a, an action game, and it's obviously not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, th this was actually a launch game for the GameCube, and it was well, it wasn't the first game to not star Mario. Um, that would be Where's Mario, which wasn't even developed by Nintendo. But this is probably one of the more popular games that didn't even star Mario. He actually, I have to say, looking at the ghosts and stuff here, that does kind of give the Ghostbusters feel to it. I think. It's very Ghostbusters. The ghosts are very colorful and funny looking, and especially some of the boss ones. Like, <laughs> this is actually kind of disturbing. You, one of the bosses is a baby ghost. Yeah, that could be. <laughs> yeah, you gotta wonder about that. Yeah, some of the those actually remind me of the kind of the Pac-Man ghosts. <laughs> the, those the little blobs with the big eyes. You keep blinking in Clyde. <laughs> yeah, though I think um Clyde must have went on a diet because he's pretty thin in this. Very tall and skinny. I guess he never caught Pac-Man before he moved over here. <laughs> Yeah, one of the things I liked about this was the atmosphere, or whatever, 
while it wasn't really scary per se, they did some interesting things with the sound. When you're in when you're in the dark and walking around and with your flashlight, um, Luigi is actually whistling the theme to the game. And as your health goes down, he his voice kind of gets um wavery and sort of unsure and more and more terrified. Because you they're they're all through the A button on the controller, which is like the biggest button on there. Um, basically just makes him call Mario for no apparent reason. So you can run through the whole mansion just shouting, Mario, Mario! And Mario never comes. Nope. Because <laughs> he's stuck in a painting. But yeah, if, if your health is like way down and you, and you hit the A button, he'll... and he shouts Mario, he sounds really, um... Desperate and weak and terrified. Now Joshua, I think you actually have stumbled on something here. If you have a, a game that's actually themed specifically for Halloween, it does seem to have a lighter side to it because, I mean, Halloween's basically a kid's holiday. And the kids go out and, you know, they get scared and stuff. You might have a haunted house on your roof, you know, the kids are walking. But they also get, you know, giggling in each other's costumes and stuff like that. And it seems that the games that are specifically geared to Halloween are that same way. They're a bit whimsical, you know, a little bit of frightening stuff, but nothing too major. And then you have this whole separate genre of the horror suspense type stuff. Mm -hmm. This would definitely fall under the, uh, the Halloween genre. Yeah, very, very much so. The Halloween has sort of become a kid's holiday. But I suppose the adults go and they like getting lots of candy too. Or shooters. Or that. <laughs> Have you ever been to any of the bar Halloween thing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but the weekend before Halloween is often party. Uh, yeah. Is often that type of day. That's why around here, when Halloween's on Saturday nights, they're always not keen about it. <laughs> yeah, because all the adults are away down at the, down the bars or whatever, and there's nobody giving away candy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let's see, next game. This is a slightly more modern. Well, actually, I think it was around the same year as Luigi's Mansion. No, the same year as the last game on our list. Um, Fear. For this initially was the was a PC game. I believe. Yeah, I believe it came out on the PC first and then ported out later. Well, that, it was made by Sierra. Um, that is in Sierra on the you know did Wiz or uh, King's Quest and all that stuff. I, it, well, it says the publisher was Ven Ven Vivan. I can never say it. Vivendi. 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 Just when you had the intro screen going here, I thought I saw Sierra on there. So I don't know if it's yeah. Screen. Sierra, the Sierra is on the cover. Did S yeah. Sierra merged with somebody? Was it the Vivendi? Yes. Uh, I think Sierra went bankrupt or had troubles, and Vivendi came in and bought them out. At that point. And I think the Williams husband and wife team were already long gone from there. Too. Yeah, exactly. It was corporate. Sierra was a big corporate company by that time. Yep. Yeah. Now this game I played, and it's one of the few games I gotta say it would probably make you jump. <laughs> well, it's a first-person game, which that already kind of inherently does that because you have the sort of tunnel vision. You can never quite see what's coming off the sides. Well, that too, but you'd be walking along and hit a spot, and then the without going into too much of the plot, but it's pretty convoluted but there's a a lot of psychic events and this little girl that you see on the cover of the the box for example she's like this powerful psychic and she's affecting you and you go into these other world events and you relive times and she's there and like i mean the first time you see her you're going down a ladder and all of a sudden boom she's right there behind you and then boom flash and she's gone right and i was like what the heck <laughs> <laughs> well, what is it with these little girls being these creepy demonic um, 
powers. Because having a little kid being creepy is actually more creepy than an adult being so. Because exactly. children are equ equated with being innocent. And exactly. if you yes. find a child that is actually inherently evil, that's more creepy than if an adult is. Correct. So this is about paranormal stuff, right? Yeah. But it plays like Doom 3. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, the graphics, like the darkness of the shadows and stuff actually resembles Doom 3 style-wise. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, there was a multiplayer version of this that a lot of people played. You're basically a special forces team of, of these... Uh, First you know, Encounter superhuman. Assault Recon. Yeah. Or Fear. Yeah, and you have superhuman reflexes you've been basing experimented on. Oh. And, uh, You're a steroid poster boy. <laughs> well, it was mentally and other things, I guess. And uh, Captain America. You're trying to f figure out the whole story behind of what you're supposed to be doing here in this, uh, chasing after this girl. And it's a... Uh, you know, like for the time, as I said, it's one of the few games that I could say, you know, you, you just didn't know what was going to happen. It's not one of those games that you can replay and not get the same effect because <laughs> the points are very scripted for some of these events. Mm -hmm. But when they happen, they, you just don't know what's happening. You know, when so Hallway's turn to blood. It's really good as a single run through game, but it's not one that has a lot of replay. Unless you play the multiplayer. And then that's no fear in that. There's just. You know, multiplayer, but uh, yeah, it's not something I would recommend for uh, um, a second playthrough. Well, it's kind of they, they kind of except for the all the shooting and whatnot. They kind of went for that Silent Hill effect, didn't they? Were they didn't always just constantly throw stuff in front of your face to terrify you? It was more in the atmosphere. Yeah, and then they threw it at you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I um, think there's... the games that work best are the ones that have the atmosphere, because just throwing stuff at, at you constantly might scare the initial few times, but after that, you kind of expect it. You know, I'm gonna uh -huh. get right away. Yeah, this Once one... Get that eerie mood, that's the ones that really hooked me. Yeah, this one was dark, and it did really well, because it took you out of the game into these other worlds. Uh, you know, as I said, you're walking down a hallway, all of a sudden the doors lock, things lock up. The hall starts filling with blood uh, dripping out of the walls, that kind of stuff. It, it really plays with your mind as to what's going on. That kind of sounds like it's, it's got some loose basement on the uh, our base on The Shining. Somewhat. Yeah. And, uh, you know, all games have to be based on something. You know, mix and mash and mm -hmm. put them in the blender and see what comes out. You know, so, but it, it was a, for a PC, a, you know, like scary games are hard and few between lately and it's yeah, hard it's to make a scary rather than just you know a brief shock of you know something jumped mm -hmm. out at you. yeah it's hard yeah. to make something truly scary I'm and, remember, yeah. what's that current zombie one where they the trailer for it actually played in reverse oh dead um, island dead island yeah that that one looks like that one potentially i haven't played it really, really, really. um from that what just... i've seen it plays completely different from what you think the trailer is yeah that's what everyone says the trailer is for a movie that's not that's not a trailer for the game um oh, it, sucks. it plays something similar from what i've seen as um dead rising where you have it stuck in the mall and you gotta build weapons the weapons wear out you have to get money and trade it's like an rpg that's exactly what dead it's island just a zombie is. massacre you just mm -hmm. Uh, blow everything up because actually the trailer looked really awesome <laughs> and that's what a lot yeah. of people complained about awesome trailer yeah. game yeah it's just like a movie it's just like a movie awesome trailer crappy movie yeah. Yeah. You know, which is like the cutscenes we were talking about earlier you can have awesome cutscenes and then it doesn't resemble the game exactly yeah. same thing oh, history repeats itself but this game had an awesome trailer it was an awesome game it's worth playing through once <laughs> Um, it's it, it, it's like Ring. If you ever seen the original Japanese version of the Ring called Ringu, no, I haven't seen it. Um, that's what this game's like. It's a very you think you're going somewhere, and then all of a sudden it goes wacky, and it, in doing so, it actually scares you. Yeah, just when everything seems to be settled into a normal pace, and you know what you're doing, they throw you Some for girl another. Comes out of the TV, you know. Uh, it just. <laughs> <laughs> 
it, it, it's it's kind of a neat. Uh, it's got a good story to it. Um, you know, it's it, it was a good fun game. All right. Well, our last game, um, back on the GameCube, and I, this was actually I think around the same time as Fear, is Geist. Another game where you play as a ghost. And this is also a first-person shooter, but it's it's another one of those where it's sort of a different kind of first-person shooter. Um. It it actually kind of reminds me of Portal. Because you play as this guy who's apparently had his spirit sucked out of him or something. Um, so you're a ghost. And you're trying to get out of this evil research complex. And your primary ability is to possess things. Like on the Polter guy. <laughs> So it actually has a lot of similar mechanics, except you can actually possess people. And, and look, by the looks of it, it seems to be a bit more of a serious game than the Poulter guy was. <laughs> yes, it's an M-rated game. <laughs> so you magical, and, right? That's what that means. Yes, M, -M for magical. <laughs> That's what I mean. <laughs> but it, it sort of reminds me of um, Portal, and that's where it's sort of puzzle-based rather than pure shooter. Okay, because I was just going to ask if it was something like Doom in reverse, because all the demons are possessing all the humans and stuff in Doom. No, this, you're, you're, you're the ghost, and you have to, in order, because apparently you can't stay in ghost form. You can't just wander the halls in ghost form. They apparently drains your spirit or something crazy like that. So you have to possess things... And you can actually possess um, just about anything in the game and make it do different stuff, like in Poltergei. But you do that in order to scare um, the people around so that you can then possess them. Oh, you can only possess them if they're scared. Yes, you, they, they have like a little aura that shows whether they're scared or whatever, and you can only possess them once they've been scared and rendered um, weak or whatever and that's how you actually progress through the levels in each room is by figuring out how to scare and possess different objects to terrify a human nearby, possess them and use their um, access to move throughout the complex so you like possess so, a... so you, you'd show somebody like a uh... Well, say the Apple swipe to unlock patent, and the fact that that legitimized, that would scare them, and then you could possess them. Yes, if, if Steve Jobs or um no, if some <laughs> Android guy was in here, and green, that would that would fit. Parker, With thumbs. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> oh God, what are you doing? Frank and thumbs. They're all thumbs. Mm. Yeah, and this also that seemed to be a lot more strategy than, as you said, than your regular uh, just first-person shooter. Yeah, the, very, the, the, sounds like a very, uh, and I'm going to say this, but slow game. <laughs> it starts out kind of slow, actually. Yes. Yeah, as you learn to do everything. Yes, and your tutor is another ghost who is a little girl. <laughs> Again. <laughs> uh, yeah, again with the little girls. The this, innocence corrupts. It's probably the most dangerous thing in the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she probably turned out to be like the villain or something. Well, psychologically, like I mentioned before, that does work. I mean, you associate children with innocence and mm -hmm. have them totally corrupted and evil. That's, that's more horrific. Except in this case, you said it's your guide that's teaching you to do things? Yes, yeah, so your, your guide who's te basically teaching you how to be a ghost. Everything is this little girl ghost with a teddy bear something greater than what you were explore your new surroundings I, I, i'd be curious if You're she does turn out to be something else in the end. It sort of looks fable-y three here yes this is this is the this evil corporation is somehow experimenting with trying to create ghost soldiers or something try one so they create this um virtual environment 
that they trap you in and you move around and but then the program like glitches out or something so then it it allows you to escape I think that I think the girl that possesses the computer and destroys it when it's red you can possess the animal try it but yeah you can possess like an small animals you can possess telephone boxes trash paint trash cans how do you scare a trash can never imagine well see inanimate objects don't don't have to be scared you can you can just possess those. You use the inanimate objects to scare the people, so you can then possess them. Well, that's more like Poltergeist, where you're animating. Yeah, it's exactly like it. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're you're scaring the people in order to possess them, and then move around the, throughout the complex. Because apparently, you can't go through walls or stuff. This, this could almost be, in principle be considered almost a sequel to the There's a lot of the same gameplay mechanics, I guess. Yeah, it's. Definitely, whether or not intentionally, heavily inspired by a polter guy. Mm. Which I think this may have actually had the same amount of success as polter guy, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to admit, I've never heard of it until now. <laughs> I can't say I have either. I heard of it, but it was one of those games that just sort of comes in under the radar and then disappears and you never hear of it, of it again. Mm. I wonder why. <laughs> Um, it is good that people are experimenting with something that's a little bit different than the beaten path. I mean, you're not going to get success all the time, but at least they're trying to do something original because right now everything seems to be a clone of everything else and it's all the same couple of genres and it's yeah. starting to get dull on its own. We need one more zombie game. Oh, yeah. Except we'll make them blue this time. Mm. And shoot their heads off. Rainbows come out. <laughs> <laughs> Unicorn zombies. There you go. Yeah. Neon zombie. <sighs> zombie trash cans, since you can animate those. Well, in Alan Wake stuff, from, in Alan Wake stuff, used to get um, possessed, right? The oh yes, the the poltergusts or poltergeists. Yeah. And then you had to fight off the taken with your flashlight, all of Luigi. Yep. And that was a. I mean, it's not on this list, but I've got to say that is the most. That wouldn't you know, be on the list if it if it wasn't a new game, it wasn't yeah. a modern one. But it's, yeah, that, that was a retro theme. <laughs> yeah, it, it's not really all that retro when it's only a year old or two. <laughs> yeah, that that game was some kind of creepy. That was a really good game, and it was really creepy, very atmospheric, and it's one of that you can replay. Uh huh. Well, because there's a nightmare mode that makes it even harder and actually has a little bit more content. And in order to do some of the achievements, you have to play it in nightmare mode because yep. you can't collect stuff because it's not there otherwise. <laughs> yep. And some of those completists for those achievements. The achievement hunters. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I think that may oh oh wait we're gonna possess a mop bucket what do we do with a mop bucket apparently nothing yeah how scary would a possessed mop bucket be <laughs> well, depending <laughs> on if it started filling with blood clean up in oh. aisle three <laughs> <laughs> oh here we can possess a pinball machine or a, some kind of old yeah it's an old cabinet. shooting game a shoot a shooter gallery. Yeah. Well, there was a, a a video game in the McKenzie Brothers movie that got briefly possessed, wasn't it? Can't remember that. I think the the professor's electrical ghost came out and said nice effects A or something like that. I'm trying to remember. I've seen it. Yeah, it's entirely possible. <laughs> That's a movie I haven't watched in a while. No, I haven't either. Oh, look at that! We possess a we possess a paint can and make it explode. Yeah, that girl is kind of creepy. <laughs> the way she says your name, and then of course when she's floating around, she's giggling, like she's got something up her sleeve. Well, we have run 
over an hour and a half. <laughs> well, it was a long list of games you had. Yeah, and this isn't even, isn't even half the spooky, creepy Halloween games. Well, that's good because that means we can have like a new Halloween show every year and, and have lots to. Yeah, we definitely could. Indeed. Maybe we could do like um that haunted house game for the. Was it the Atari or the PC that was like all lines? One of those old vector games. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was real scary. There was a really good one too on the TurboGrafx-16. I'm trying to remember what the heck it was. Oh, actually, it was... it's on its own. Oh, Splatterhouse. Huh? That's actually on multiple platforms, but that's where I first played it. Yeah, I remember that one. Uh, Phantasmagoria, which is another Sierra Online yep. game. That was <laughs> creepy. <laughs> I've seen, I've heard of that one. Yeah, Spider yeah. wasn't really creepy. It was more like you're playing Jason from Friday the 13th and you're trying to rescue the girl after you get possessed by this mask. Mm. It, was a, it was a fun one. It was a side scrolling hack and slab, or hack and slash, I guess, but. All right, well. That will do it for this week. Um, if you want to watch more shows and find some retro reviews, you can check out my blog at RetroGamesForever.com. Um, follow me on Twitter, JoshuaCaleb75, or Google+. Um, you guys want to plug your Twitter or Google+, stuff? Go ahead, Curtis. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't have a Twitter account, so I can't can't plug that. I am on on Google Plus. Um, yeah, so you just skipped right over Twitter. <laughs> I don't have that much interesting to say, to be honest. I don't want to be one of those Twitter people who goes, "I had lunch today." <laughs> and uh, then you have a, I used a napkin, and then I had a glass of water. <laughs> yeah, we need we need we need more of those. The water was a little tepid, but other than that, you can be Stephen Fry too. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I'm, I'm on Google+. Plus. Um, I get bursts of being active. It depends on what my work schedule's like. I just came out of Rush Seasons, which is why you haven't seen me on the podcast here, because I've been swamped and trying to mm. do a bunch of accounting stuff for coming up year-end and stuff, too. So hopefully I'll free up some time here in the next little while. And actually start doing things. When the snow more. starts on the ground? <laughs> uh, no, nothing yet. We, we did have a brief swish of it today, um, and we had a little bit on the weekend that you know, melted before it hit the ground. I think nothing like these coals got... But uh, actually, our Halloween was snow free, which is nice because it's, it's a hit or miss whether it's going to be snow free. Or... Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm on um, Twitter at Smoke Me a Kipper. <laughs> and I'm on Google Plus as Graham Ellis. And I'm, I haven't really got all that interesting to say, but I did do a nice review of the Kobo Vox on GDGT or Gadget.com if you want to read that. Gidget. Gidget. <laughs> no, Gidget, no. I'm sure Ryan will appreciate calling it Gidget. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for watching. And we will be back to haunt the past um, in the future, I guess. <laughs> well, see you next week.